Uh, I'm here. Let's start. Okay. So, thank you for coming back. Um, we're going to continue the afternoon session now. We have uh, uh, Dr. Christian Berquist from University of Copenhagen, who will talk to us about the Google EU shopping decision. The floor is yours. Thank you for that. Um, before um, starting, I'm just a bit curious to understand how many of you have any experience with competition law as a lawyer, economist, or student? Oh, most of you. So when I talk about the relevant market, uh, dominance, abuse, you do know approximately what I'm talking about? You know it? Yeah, you. Yeah. You, you know what the relevant market is? Yes, it's the... Okay. <laughs> No, no, you have to define it, you know. It's, it's, not, a, it's not on the exam. <laughs> Normally when I ask my students, sometimes they get a bit frightened, but then it's not on the exam. But this would actually be on the exam. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some observations that I've made about the Google uh, search case. Um, but before I do that, I would like, to, uh, I would like to, to revert to some of the questions that have been earlier, because, you know, I have noticed that we said a lot about Google and, you know, Facebook, et cetera. And, uh, yeah. Does everybody know these companies? Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google? Yeah, I've just been to North Korea, and there's a lot of people who don't know what they do. But here, everybody knows. The point is that do they do something that we don't like, or do we like them? What do you say? You like them? They don't do nothing bad? Yeah. Some of them don't pay taxes. You don't mind that? Nah, neither do I. Nobody pays taxes. Some people claim to pay taxes happily, but they're lying. Some of them are abusing our information, you know. I'm, I'm near, really not an expert about what happened in the Facebook case, but allegedly, you know, some of the information that we have been sharing has been abused in the American election. I don't want to pass judgment. Apparently, they are abusing our trust a bit. And Google, you know, they have been fined twice by the European Commission. And they have a very large number of cases pending around in the, uh, in the world. I've, I've tried to keep track, of, but I've totally lost the ability to do that. But at least they have been fined twice. So you can see they have actually been convicted for harming competition. So the point is that, you know, we can be on the balance and say, well, perhaps to do a bit of harm, perhaps to do something good. But, you know, all of them are more or less subject to some kind of uh, allegation or pending investigation or even a uh, case of doing harm to competition that is killing the competitor. And if we assume, and I don't want to, to pass judgment, but if we assume that on the balance they do more harm than good, we need to regulate. And of course, the question emerges how to do that. Should we adopt some laws, or should we try to use competition law? And if we decide to use competition law, we of course have to find out, can we actually do that? Can we actually successfully apply competition law to big data? As a law professor, of course, I would tend to say yes, and I'm not the only one. The chief economist of the British Competition Authority says yes, so does OECD. They also say yes, we can successfully apply competition law to big data. However, if we actually read the report, we will see the things are a little more complicated because it's platform, platforms are complex, it's complex to define markets, it's complex to make the market power, and it's really, really, it's more easy to conduct exclusionary conduct. You know, even though OECD says yes, they have a lot of reservation. And if we start looking into the Google case, we can actually see more about that. Because the commission's decision actually says that, well, the first problem we have in defining the market is complicated because we cannot use the SNP test. Do you know what the SNP test is? Can you explain it? And what does that mean in ordinary High layman? Market price, it means um, if, if a market player would rise a price in a certain market, then the consumers would switch to a competitor. Yes. And uh, when, uh, when the consumer stops switching to competitor, that's the, yes. the relevant Yes. You go to your favorite bar, and they have raised the price, then you go to another bar. Yes. That's what it actually means. The problem is, here, there is no price. You don't really pay for going on Google and searching. Of course, you pay with your information, but you don't pay any fee. So how do you apply the SNP test? Well, you don't. 
and the commission says we don't have to because it's a two-sided platform. So even though you don't pay for going on Google and searching for, do you use Google? Yes. Yes, a lot. Did you did you Google me before? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Will you do it afterward? The point is, even though you don't pay for doing it, it doesn't matter because you know you give information, and Google can use that. So they can recoup on the other side of the platform. And because Google is a two-sided platform, we don't really need to use the SNP test. However, is Google truly a two-sided platform? Well, I don't know. If we apply the test or the definition of two-sided platform that's been suggested by OECD, I don't think Google is a two-sided platform because there has to be a connection. You know, you don't pay, but the other side can recoup. And there is a connection, of course. The more you use Google, the more everybody uses more Google, the more information and all those information they can monetize because they can use it to sell advertisement. But there's no direct collection, so it's weak. So personally, I don't think Google search meet the definition suggested by OCD. So you know, from the very beginning, we are getting a bit concerned about applying competition law to big data as illustrated by the Google case. So if we want to know if we can do it, we have to ask three questions. By the way, who's that? Yes, you like him? He's a great actor, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I love both of them. There's three questions. Can you define the market successfully? Can you formulate a theory of harm? And can you mandate adequate remedies? Of course, there's more questions, but that is the essential question if you should apply competition or successfully to big data. And I have to make a reservation because, you know, no matter how many times I read the decision, you know, I've been working with the Google case for several years, no matter how many times I deal I still, there's just things I just don't understand. You know, I understand the internet to some extent, just like I understand when I touch my light at home or my television, something happens. But I do not, I'm not really able to explain the, the advanced thing is. And more importantly, is internet is constantly evolving, meaning that what Google has done is actually so much yesterday, things has changed. And I have had a bit of a problem actually finding example to illustrate the case, but I've to some extent been successful. But I have not been able to find it on, uh, on Riga and Latvian because I, I, I know it's possible to cheat Google so they believe that you are in Latvia, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. So most of the example will be Danish and American. Yeah, defining the market. In the market, we have a number of players. I've listed some of them. Content provider, advertiser, search engine, comparison shop. I'm going to explain who these are. They are more active players in the market, but these are the players who are essential to know in order to understand the Google search decision. Content provider. You know, you go to a local newspaper and then you'll get some news and some gossip or whatever you check into. This is from a Danish newspaper. It's English speaking. This is uh, the content provider that is the page. Here you have different kind of advertisements. Some of them are provided by Google. We also have comparison shopping. You use comparison shopping. I talked to you about it. Yeah. Do you, what do you use it for? Um, to find your product. Yeah. And how would you do that? You, you go to Google Shopping. Yeah. Uh, I would, um, I would uh, type uh, the the searched product uh, yeah. in in Google and then find out. Uh, is it let, let's see. Does for it me, it is. Yes, so you, if, if it's good for you, it's perfect. You know, it, 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 I don't use it because, you know, but you, you use it and you're happy with it. Yes. Yes. So comparison shopping is you need a product and you can go to different provider. This is Google. This is Fundem. Fundem is quite interesting because that is the original plaintiff. They claim that Google has downgraded them. So whenever you search for a product, you would never go to them. You would automatically go to Google. But the point is that you're looking for a watch or shoes or whatever. You go to one of these comparison shopping and you can find the prices. And what actually happens if you go to them? Can you buy them there? No, it will uh, forward me on yes. the Yes, you will find side. a product and then you charge it, then we'll forward you to somebody else and then you can buy the product there. Yes. So when you search, you also have different options. I do not, ex I do not necessarily believe you understand this, but you know, you have general searches and you have specialized searches. I'm gonna explain what it is. Let's assume that you want to find something, a product. You go to a general searches that could be Google, and you just simply search for something. You also have some specialized flights. Do you want to go on a travel? Not with me, but with somebody else. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you who you're going to take with you. Where do you want to go? Booking, 
looking that's come. Yeah, where do you want to go? Paris? London. London, yes, nice city. So how are you going to find out if you go to London? You go to what? Mm, to the Google. Yeah, you can go to Google, but you could also go to, what about Expedia? You use that? No. No, you don't. Oh, no, yeah, <laughs> there you have the dinosaur. I'm the dinosaur. I use Expedia. But you have Google. The point is that you can go to Expedia. I would do that because mm -hmm. I do not know the alternative. But Google also have Google Flights. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. also have Google Maps. So you can find out where the university is or where dinners are, where people are meeting. So you have general searches. That is the horizontal. You know, you just search for somebody or for anything. But you also have specializes. You know, that could be travel, flights could be products. So you have general searches and specialized searches, also called horizontal and vertical searches. It's, it's important to understand that. This is a general search engine. It could be a university. And you, you know about this, it's called blue link because they tend to be blue. And you just push one of them. So you search for university, it could be anything. You've got this list. And up here, you've got some sponsored list. I do not know if it's still like that because they constantly change the way the system works, but this was how I looked for a couple of months ago. Of course, they decide this, you know, they pay for it. The other one basically paid on some kind of, uh, sorry, they decided basically, you know, I did this from Copenhagen, so obviously they put Danish University on top, and then, you know, Harvard University comes somewhere down there. So they evolve that the more I search, you know, whenever you search for something, they got to add up, says, why is it everybody in Riga is searching for a product? The algorithm get better and therefore the search becomes more and more intelligent. This is very important because this is the very reason why I believe most of you are using Google. Does anybody use Bing? No? You laugh. Because it's very bad. <laughs> Yeah, nobody used Bing. The point is everybody used Google because it's much better. And the reason why it's much better is because as everybody uses it, it becomes better and better. We call that networks effects. And of course, also the word Google, it sounds more sexy than Bing, right? We call that bandwagon effect. So of course, everybody goes to the same pop because it's the most hottest. Everybody uses Google because it's the best one. Google's business essentially about selling sponsored, sponsored links up here, advertisement and advertisement. So if you have a home page, it could be whatever, it could be a university, you might have some advertisement and I have no idea how much money you get based on it, but I presume the more people who go into the page, the more money you get. Google sells this and they also sell this. This is basically their business. Let's assume you want to have a pair of shoes. Does anybody know what uh, Christian Lepetron is? Yeah, normally I only ask the male student because they rarely know it. It's, you're laughing. Can you help us out? What is it? It's a shoe. It's a nice shoes. It's a shoe brand. Is it a good one? You have any? No, I don't. But uh, it has a red sole. <laughs> yes, it's very easy to uh, to recognize. recognize. You will very often see it when you go to law firms. <laughs> yes, and uh, the point is that it's very nice shoes, right? We can kind of come back to that later. Why you don't have any? So if you go to Google, you get something that looks like this. You type in your query. You know, you need a criminal lawyer, you're in US. Here you have an info box. Here you have, you know, sponsored links. And here you actually have the traditional blue links. You know, some of these lawyers, you know, Johnny Cochran, he, uh, he's dead, but he's, he used to be very good, you know. I have no idea how he managed to get O.J. Simpson uh, of the hook, but he did that. So he was a very good lawyer, and if you really need that, uh, it's no longer possible, but if you need a leader, really needed a lawyer, you would call him. So the point is that here is something to actually make money on. This is for free, and this is also for free. But the point is that, you know, if we had searched directly for Johnny Cochran, we would get some bio about him when he was born and when he died, and some famous cases. So it actually helped us to get valuable information. That is what we normally use Google for. We can go back to the Lebutang shoes. You don't have any shoes. Why don't you have any? That Louboutin, they're too uncomfortable. <laughs> I prefer sneakers. So o you, over, over. So you don't like them, actually? No, they're beautiful, but probably not that comfortable. OK. But I knew you at the end, because I talked to you. You like them, right? Uh, <laughs> OK, yes, I do. Yes. But I don't have 
So when your boyfriend tells you what you want for Christmas, you tell him a, a pair of Lapitang shoes. You probably have to spell it for him because he doesn't really know what it is. Sure. Yeah. He, uh, he types it in. He can say, oh, I can learn it's woman's shoes. Okay, I already knew that. And I can learn something about the story. And I can actually, ah, shopping. And here you can actually see where you can get it in Copenhagen. And here I can actually see the price. And then he looks at the price and says, okay, I'm going to get you something else. So the point what Google do is actually you type in one thing, like the shoes, and they actually offer you three searches. So therefore, Google basically is blending vertical and horizontal search, and then they throw in on top the Google Shopping. So you don't have to go to Google Flight. You don't have to go to Expedia. You can get everything from one search. That is basically what Google do. And do we like that? Yes, we do that, actually. It's very convenient, you know. Everything is nice until I realize the price is a bit tacky, and then I've got to buy something else. So Google basically blend horizontal and vertical search and throw on top a search from the Google Shopping. So to me, it's an improvement. To me, it's an improvement. That is not the way the commission, of course, the competitors look at it. They claim, oh, there's also saying, I think it's plausible. If we talk about general horizontal search, Google has a 90% market share. I would even say 100%. You know, I know nobody who uses anything else than Google. And you know, I, I do not necessarily believe that we can draw a hard conclusion based on here, but nobody admitted using anything else than, uh, than Google. And I don't know if that's true because you, know, you don't use it or you didn't want to disclose it. We also have specialized searches, and you know, to some extent it makes sense, and we have comparison shopping. So basically, Google says there's one way of searching the internet, that is what they're offering. DGCom, that is the commission, says there's essentially three ways of searching. Horizontal, vertical, and comparison shopping. They don't directly say comparison shopping is a, is a way of searching, but in reality it is. Because you know, if I just want the price, you know, I get it here. I get it here, and then I realize I have to buy something else for the girlfriend because it's a bit tacky. Yeah, she probably wanted some, some socks or something else. So while Google claimed that they are basically offering one search that is rebutted, the commission don't believe that. I'm not really in a position to say which is right or wrong because, you know, I just use the internet, and to some extent, I can actually follow saying that, well, you know, I Google somebody, and then I go into a specialized service, I want to find the best flight, or I want to find the best night clock, or the best map. So to somehow, it looks like the commission is partly right, and more important, Google has not challenged that before the court. So they have accepted the market definition. I do not know if they've done that because, you know, we have to focus, or because they agree. But there are other things about the Google search decision that I'm very skeptic about. I'm going to share that to you now. Because this doesn't really fit into how I personally view the internet. And more importantly, it was also rejected in the US, US decision. That's very interesting because that allows us to compare the European decision with the American decision. If we go back, if we go back, we can talk about how the internet has evolved. And you know, out here, that was when I was studying, and that was when we also had dinosaurs roaming in the street, and you really have to be cautious because although we got eaten by the dinosaurs when we were moving to the schools. I am happy to see that there are other people that are just as old as I am. I'm, I'm 29 and a month. Yeah, you're laughing. You remember the old internet? It was stupid, right? Yeah. Yes. And I, do not, I don't really want to put yeah, but let's say that's before somewhere around 2000 and 2002, perhaps. The point is, you went on the internet, and you couldn't really search for anything because everything was predefined. So you wanted to know something about shoes. You had to find, you know, accessories for women and then shoes and then very expensive, extremely expensive, and then you have cotton leather trunk shoes. So the point is that you couldn't really search anything. It had to be predefined. So that was the old stupid internet. Then somewhere around 2002, 2003 or whatever, you got something more specialized that was the general search in which they've actually checked it in advance and you can search for it. And I think the first time I used Expedia, that was in 2006, I think. Uh, I don't know if any 
do you have any recollection when you use one of these specialized searches first time? Yeah, Google came out in 1998, I think. But the specialized searches, you know, Expedia, different kind of specialized that could focus on certain things came out somewhere around 2005 and 6, somewhere. And, of course, you've got comparison shopping. And, you know, I'm not saying it, but I would like to say that that makes some sense to talk first generation, second generation, and perhaps, you know, you have universal search where everything is blended. This is the way I personally believe Google likes to see the market. And I can follow them to some extent because, you know, I remember the old stupid internet, you know, and assuming we're here, I actually, uh, it's really good, you know. When I'm looking for a hotel, I can type in the name. I even got the map. You know, I even managed to find a school uh, where I have to show up this morning at 10 o'clock using Google Maps. So to some extent, it makes sense, you know. I can find a lot about the university here based on just putting it in on a normal horizontal search. So this is one way of looking at the internet, but it is not the way the European Commission look at it. They separate it. But, you know, it somehow fit into the way I view it. It doesn't mean it is true, but, you know, I like to use the fact that I can check something. Whenever I have a market, it makes sense to go down to the supermarket and say, does this actually compute in what I personally experience here? If we check the, uh, the American decision, there was no decision because it was close. But of course, there was a decision. But we only have four pages. But we know that it was very advanced decision because it was accidentally released. But it was only released on every second page. So it's really weird reading it because you have to guess what's on the other side. But it looks a lot like the, uh, the FTC, that is the American enforcer, decided we want to respect innovation. And we don't really feel comfortable saying that comparison shopping is not innovation. So it looks a lot like why this is the way I view the market. This is also the way Google view the market. It looks a lot like this was accepted tacitly in the American decision, but it has not been accepted in the European decision. That's interesting because, you know, when we define the market, I think it's safe to conclude on the, you know, what I have submitted and explained to you, compared the European with the American cases, that we have a lot of doors. So when we decide markets in big data, we have so many options, which of course means dangerous because you know, when you move in one door, you're kind of preventing moving in the other door. And, and you, know, you do not know, you know I, you, when you're opening one door, there might be something better on the other side. You don't know that. And we cannot use the SNP test. You know, I, I'm not an economist, and I, you're an economist. Have you actually tried using the SNP test in a case? Yeah. It, and it, it, it managed, it, it, it was good? Okay, because the good thing about being a lawyer is, I, I don't know, I'm just going to call an adult which is an economist there. I don't really know how to use the SNP test, but, you know, the economists can do it. And, it, you know, it doesn't really make sense going into the supermarket and what happens if the price goes up. But to some extent, it makes some sense. You know, so what would happen if my favorite supermarket was closed? What would I go instead, you know? What happened if I cannot get my favorite brand of whiskey? Which would I buy instead? So the SNP test makes sense to me, you know, in theory, and if I cannot really make sense of it, I can call an economist and you can do the calculation. Yeah, that's good. You can always call an adult. That's very important. Yeah, then we come to finding a theory of harm. What the commission says and has held uh, Google accountable for is that whenever you search for products, they only show their own products. You know, alternative, this is Google Shopping, alternative is somewhere down here and nobody, you know, you can, you can actually touch, you know, and move on, but nobody do that. Only the five and six top ranking is actually the one you look at. And more importantly, Google allows Google Shopping, which is an affiliated company, to have pictures. And it looks much more significant, you know. Let's assume I do actually want to buy the product. I don't think I would buy a pair of shoes that expensive on the internet, but let's assume I want to do that. I can actually buy here. So Google only allow its own subsidiary or affiliate, group affiliate activities to be displayed up here. Everybody else is down here, and that is, you know, malicious downgrading. That is essentially the theory of harm. 
And the idea is that you might be able to find the shoes other places cheaper. So as a consumer, you do not necessarily get the best offer, but more importantly, you are denied the opportunity to check alternative. And competition law in Europe is very much about choices, very much about choices. There is a very advanced algorithm, and you know, no matter how many times I read that, I totally fail to understand how it works. But it looks like whenever you're typing in a query, they make a decision based on, you know, what are you searching for, what have other been searching for, and whenever you choose it, you know, you put in university, what is the most likely of those links you're going to choose for? And in Copenhagen or Denmark, it's most likely a Danish university. So if I'm searching for Denmark, I'm going to be presented with Danish University and then perhaps Harvard because, you know, I've heard about Harvard in US. So that very advanced algorithm is allegedly used in order to make certain that you guess what you actually are searching for. But the commission and competitor claims that those penalty for not really complying with it is not applied to Google's own service. Google denies that, but it looks like uh, there's something about it. There's a lot about, you know, there are indications of malicious strategy, but it's extracted from email, you know. And when I think back, stupid things I put into email, you know, you can probably also concoct a theory saying that I have malicious intent because, you know, if you only present some of the email and not the entire picture, so I don't really know what to extract for it. But more importantly, there's a lot of graphic. And when you look at the graphic, it does actually look like there's something happened because it looks like a competitor constantly downgraded and Google's own services is not. So it looks suspiciously. And that is one thing lawyers always look for. We look for suspicious pattern. And sometimes we call it the economies, right? Yeah, well, it depends on how much you pay us. Okay, it depends on, yeah, no, that's a conclusion, you know. If I don't get, if I call an economist, I don't like a conclusion, I'm just going to call another economist, yeah. Just like going to the doctor. You don't like what the doctor tells you, you just find another doctor. So the abuse, this is the definition of the abuse. The abuse is as, um, a behavior outside of the scope of a dominant company and basically directing traffic in the direction of Google's own services. That is what they are not allowed to do, which is having anti-competitive effects. So, Basically, they're saying abuse is anything able of having an anti-competitive effect. Do we have any antitrust lawyers here who are scholars in European? Anybody? Okay. Any students who are good, good grade? Yeah, you, you're a lawyer, right? Yeah. What is the normal definition of abuse? Yeah. There is uh, also harm to competition, harm to consumers, consumer welfare. Uh, there is certain negative effect in the market. Yeah, could, can you give me some example of what is normally called abusive under European uh, competition law? Abusive yeah. in short terms. It's uh, undertaking which have market power and acts uh, in a way that excludes competitors or exploits uh, consumers or clients. Yeah. So, you know, th that is in principle the definition. So the point is that if we have very suspicious pattern and it looks a lot like the competitors being killed or foreclosed, you know, that, uh, that does actually fit in because, you know, abuse is not a predefined standard. You know, anything that is anti-competitive is in principle capable of having um, an abusive effect. But normally we search for, you know, the prices is above or below, or you have refusal to supply. So we have certain standards, you know, the price has to be above and below a certain. So the point is here we have broadened it a bit. And in principle that is possible because there's a lot of advanced calculation. So we can, you know, there's tons of calculation and, you know, there's, you know, on top of all the lawyers and the economists, there's been a lot of data uh, people involved, statistic people, showing that it has actually an anti-competitive effect, you know. Nobody have heard about Fondem. Nobody used Bring. Bring is not really involved in the case. But the point is that the competitors are all gone. So it does actually look a lot like Google has been very successful in predating and you know, eliminating all the competitors. So in one way, it's positive. One way, it's positive. The problem is, of course, you know, 
does Google actually make any money on the search? No. Does anybody pay anything to Google? No. We don't pay anything. So the point is that you know, they have to make their money somewhere. And where do they make their money? Well, they do make the money on the sponsored link, which they're not allowed to list on top. They make the loan money on, uh, on comparison shopping that they're not allowed to put on top. So there's something in the case that doesn't actually make sense. You know, they're condemning something that makes sense to everybody. So essentially, essentially they are held, you know, they have, they have done something that's called abusive, and what they have actually done is self-favoring. They have put themselves on top of the list, and that is held abusive. And that doesn't really make any sense because normally we would never condemn that with one exception that is the essential facility doctrine, which is highly debatable if we actually have. So the point is that even though it's positive that there's all this calculation, all this evidence indicating that they are hurting competition, they actually held um, accountable on that stand that I have certain reservation against because self-favoring is actually quite normal in the IT sector. This is, you know, this is Danish television. We basically have two um, competing um, stations, you know, DR and TV2. Most countries have something like that. And the point, if you go to one of them, you can see all their programs, and then the competitor is only out here. The other one, they don't even list the competitor. So my point is that when we talk to big data, when we talk to about the internet, self-favoring is actually quite normal. At my hotel, I actually asked them, do you have any excursion? And they have a number. And I'm quite convinced they, they, they get a profit on them. So the point is that you know, it's quite normal to do self-favoring. So essentially, Google is held, you know, they have convicted of doing something I would normally tend to believe is quite normal when we talk about the internet. If we turn once again to the, uh, the American case, we can actually see that they are very cautious. Once again, I only have four pages officially, but I have managed to find the other pages, you know, only ever seven pages, so we don't really fully, we don't have the full story. But it looks a lot like they have, well, there's a lot of balancing, you know, one hand, on the other hand. We don't really know how the court will react to it. There's just many uncertainties. And we don't like condemning self-favoring. So U.S. don't like condemning self-favoring in contrast to EU that essentially evolve about holding self-favoring abusive when it comes to big data and the Internet. That doesn't mean that the Google search case is wrong and will be overturned when it's appealed. It's pending before the court right now. It will definitely be appealed uh, beyond that. But it does mean that they are third to discuss. You know, the concept of reduce is broad. And the question is, of course, has it been brought in too much? I'm not certain about the malicious intent, you know, because you know, they use a lot of emails, but everybody knows if you take an email out of context, you know, there can be stupid things in it that you didn't really meant. But it does look suspicious, you know, assuming that the calculations is correct. There are some, you know, minor mistakes, but that doesn't that's not something that we're not concerned about in, in Europe traditionally. What do we do about the remedies? That's the next question. You know, Google has been told that you have to stop and then you have to uh, you know, adjust your behavior. That happened last year, June 2017. They got 90 days to change it. I don't know if they have changed it. We don't really know that because the you know, commission has not turned back. But I get a lot of email. Once I started uh, um, sharing my views about the email, I got on a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, mailing lists. So I get a lot of email from those who are complaining against Google saying that they have not changed behavior. I, you know, I can see they have changed the model, but I do not know if they have fulfilled the obligation. So even though it is more than a year ago that they were you know, fined in order to stop it, we still don't know if they have conformed with the order. And the commission are totally unwilling to, um, to even come with any suggestion about how Google should, uh, should lead off to the obligation. And we still are pending uh, the formal decision about it. And before that, there was even three attempts to close it. And I can understand why people want to close it, why the commission was very focused on it, because you know, that would have made things much more simple. So you know, the case also shows how complicated it is to design remedies when we're talking about big data. So there's a lot to discuss in court. Do you know the, who these guys are? Do you have suits in, uh, in Latvia? You have them? Yeah. yeah you like them? Yeah, who's your favorite uh, actor? Uh, I don't remember. I'm not so much into them. 
Okay. The first one in first series is uh, the white guy. I don't know the name. <laughs> this is Mike Ross, right? And this is Harvey Specter. Yeah. Yes. But I, I love it for many reasons. First of all, it's funny. And it reminds me a lot about when I was in private practice because it's the only CV series in which I've seen how important a secretary actually is and that it's quite normal to work at night and if you're late with a, late with a memo, you get fired. You know, that is exactly how I remember when I was uh, at a law firm. And also the abusive partner, I also remember them. I love that series and I'm so sad to hear that Mike Ross is leaving it. Uh, we'll see the new season. But the point is there's much to discuss in the Google case in, in the courts. But there's also some very important lesson for big data. If we assume it to be correct, it does actually underline that we can successfully apply competition law to big data. But as I explained, you know, there's a lot of decisions we have to make. You know, there's so many doors. And please remember, whenever you're entering one door, you're kind of precluding yourself to enter the other doors. And that means that there's a risk of getting it wrong. And you know, that is actually a bit frightening because you know, we should be very cautious of over-enforcement and under-enforcement because you know, even though Google has done some harm, they have actually delivered a superior product. You know, I'm old enough not to remember the dinosaurs, but I'm old enough to remember when the internet was really stupid. And I do actually enjoy many of the things that Google offers because the you know, search algorithm is so much uh, superior. I can really check out a lot of things and you know, I even used Google Translate. That was actually one of the things that uh, was missing on the earlier presentation. When I go to Brazil, there's really two things I enjoy. One, I can go into McDonald's and I don't really have to speak the language and just point and I will get what I actually have. But I also have Google Translate. So if I need to ask them a question, I can actually put it in English and it will be translated into Portuguese. So Google do actually provide superior product. So therefore, you know, when you condemn them, you might sending a dangerous message. So there is an inflated risk of over-enforcement, but there's also an inflated risk of under-enforcement. And I'm not saying that the American case was wrong, but they decided not to have any, and I don't think they will have any against the other companies. So you can also have the risk of under-enforcement. So the main conclusion you can do about Google is not only that you can you know, get a lot of discussion about academics and conference, et cetera, but it's also some very important lesson, and the lesson is that yes, you can use competition to big data, but you have to be very cautious because you have an inflated risk of mistake. And any questions or comments? Please remember, I'm, I will not. I'm, you know, I'm not a. I'm not, you know, I will not have you for exam. So you know, you can ask me any question. And, uh, I will not uh, use it against you in a court of law. Yeah. Ah, that's one. Yeah. I have a question about the demand side. Uh, of course, you. What was analyzed uh, in your presentation on in DigiCom decision is a supply side how Google acts. And what is the behavior of the demand side? Of course, it was also analyzed, and the conclusion was that usually people choose the first five listings. Yeah, I uh, think it's uh, four or five listings, yeah. Four or five listings. But isn't uh, such now that uh, also consumer behavior change? Also, I know from my experience that I'm not just looking only on the first five listings. I'm, also looking on the second page, or maybe some, some suggestion on the third page. And uh, for me, this degradation maybe is not so effective, as uh, you mentioned this term, self-favoritism, that uh, I, I previously didn't heard that uh, it's a very good term, interesting, that uh, I agree in some situations it could be legally and maybe also objective to do that. But uh, where, to your mind, in which situations this degradation of the search results becomes to the harm of consumer? Where it, um, what is, uh, you mentioned the SNP test, or and, uh, this is not used, couldn't be used yeah. in this situation, maybe other tests. My first comment, you're a lawyer, right? Yes. So am I. When I checked into the hotel yesterday, I actually in insisted reading what I was signing on. And there was a people standing in the back row behind me that was really pissed off about that. 
So the point is that I'm a lawyer, so I do actually read everything. And I actually, I, I just recently changed my mobile fine, and I actually tried to read what I was signing on, which was really frustrating because you know it, it took a lot of time to accept it. So you and me, we are unique, but I think most people, they just stick on, you know four or five for those links, they don't turn to the next page. But the other issue you raise is more interesting. Where is the consumer harm? And to be honest, I don't think there is any consumer harm. But you know, competition law in Europe is not only about uh, consumer welfare and consumer harm, it's also protecting the opportunity and the choices that you do not know that you might have. So it's a little more complicated, but you, you're raising a valid point. You know, Where is the consumer harm in it? And I don't really see that. But competition law is more than that. Uh, and my main point is that self-favoring is quite normal when we're dealing with big data. And I don't really like uh, the idea of condemning them. But if you move on, what also Phil was in your question, if there's malicious intent, if they do it intentionally, their own service is not evaluated under self-favoring. That is more than self-favoring. That is, you know, malicious intent. Then I would be more willing to see the, uh, the, the abuse. Oh. You just got my attention with terms and conditions. Uh, maybe not the best source. I, I, I need to state I'm not a lawyer in the first place. So not the best source, but I saw the terms and conditions documentary on Netflix. And there was well uh, enlightened that uh, the, a lot of terms and conditions are written in the, in the form and when the, with intention that nobody is going to read that. So you can hide something. So wouldn't that be more protective for, for uh, consumers to come up with, a, I don't know, summary or something like, in, in the simple language, some, some uh, uh, pre, uh, pre summary, w what are you actually signing upon, or would that be in, in, uh, in conflict with, uh, with the jurisdiction and so on? question actually and the first the first things I don't want to uh, to lecture you I don't like doing that but first of all you have to understand there are certain things that has to be framed in a certain manner for sure, for sure. Course, you know yeah. one of the things of being a lawyer is it's just like you know speaking English you know even though I have a, a bit of dialect and, and you're perfect English because you're American the point is we speak the same language and the benefit of, of doing in a lawyer is that you know you speak the same language because so I have to I have to put it in a certain manner so other lawyers understand totally what I understand. The downside is, of course, that as a consumer and non-lawyer, you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how can you simplify that? And that is the reoccurring nightmare. But you cannot do that because if you make it too simple, it doesn't stock up in court anymore. So it has to be complex. Check. Sometimes there are legal requirements. You have to consent on the European law. So I have to, I have to tell you what I'm going to abuse all the information that you naively have given to me because the law says that. And second, even if I was not a lawyer, a lawyer would tell me, please ask the young lady to, uh, to give her consent because then she can never sue us. Mm -hmm. So it has to be like that. But of course, sometimes I get tired because reading through it, you know, there's a lot of things, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, you know, when you are a trainer, you also learn what to look for. And of course, there are certain things that I do not like. And uh, on Netflix, you can actually turn some of them on, off. Yeah, uh, yeah. I understand that by dumbing it down, you're going to lose a lot of important details. But uh, um, on, on my uh, my uh, intention was to ask: uh, there are some companies who are willingly like making it more complicated, so so it confuses, and that you just accept. Wouldn't that be a more protective way for, for consumers if there would be somebody who is reviewing those terms and conditions and like and ensuring that they are complicated enough, but not too much? You have a valid point. You know, um, in some countries we have consumer agency who, uh, who who do that, and sometimes it's subject to negotiation. But it's just complicated when you have a cross border. And next thing is that let's assume I think Net Netflix has a lot of bargaining power, so they might not be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's actually good to have regulation because you know that just simply limit how much uh, they can abuse your information. Um, but you know, another example, I'm not on Facebook, and there are just simply a lot of uh, activities among my friends I miss out on because I'm not on Facebook, which is a, a conscious decision. I, I like to keep some distance to my students, so I'm not on Facebook, and I'm also very private because I'm. I'm, you know, I'm probably a, a dodgy person. So I'm not on Facebook, so, but that also means that I'm missing out on things. 
And, and that's a conscious decision. And sometimes you have to make a decision. You, you want to give your information away, then I'll give you something. Yeah. Okay, thanks. But you're not a lawyer? So what are you studying? Oh, yeah, I am a data scientist and okay. uh, I'm studying mathematics, yeah. It sounds like a lawyer. <laughs> thanks. say thank you, Christian. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Very much on time. <laughs>